Hello everybody and welcome to Paleo Talk. Now, this is my new sort of, uh, kind of like a podcast really, it's sort of just a talk, uh, me talking to you guys about paleontology and about the history of life on our planet and where I think things came from and certain questions that haven't been answered yet and also some misconceptions along the way about uh, prehistory. So this is going to be sort of set out a bit like a podcast, I'm not really going to edit this too much, I'm just going to upload it. Um, no crazy visuals, no real editing tricks or anything. I'm just going to be talking to you guys about, uh, about paleontology. Now, if you're wondering, I did get the idea for this from uh, one of my idols, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He does a uh, podcast called Star Talk, where he talks about astrophysics and the universe. And that's really, really interesting. You can go check that out. Um, I think it's on Spotify. I'm not really sure. But uh, I'm using a microphone really close to my face if I'm giving me some ASMR stuff, let me know in the comments and I'll move it away next time. So I'm going to be talking about the Tyrannosaurs today because a lot of people seem to think that T-Rex was the only Tyrannosaurid. You know, when you think of T-Rex, you think of this brutal, massive, powerful animal. And uh, it was, it was one of the deadliest creatures that ever walked the earth. It was so brutally powerful as a creature and a predator. And it was an apex hunter. But uh, people don't realize that it had dozens of relatives that we've discovered in the fossil record. Some of them are even scarier than Tyrannosaurus itself. Uh, probably not as powerful, I wouldn't say. Although I think the closest you could get to a, a T-Rex by that point would be uh, Despletosaurus. Now, my favorite Tyrannosaurid is probably uh, Allioramus. I don't know why. I just, I love Allioramus. It's, um, it's sort of got this really, it's a smaller Tyrannosaurid. It's only about, uh, I think it was what, 11 feet tall or 10 feet tall. Uh, so it's a little bit taller than a polar bear if it was standing on its hind legs. Um, and Allioramus was a much lighter built Tyrannosaur. Now we call these guys um, Albertosaurines. Now Albertosaurines are much lighter built, they're thinner, they're probably more agile. They're really designed for pack hunting and taking down prey as a group instead of just, you know, one massive powerful bite to the neck and taking down a massive prey animal. They're probably designed for hunting smaller prey than, uh, than their bigger relatives, uh, the Tyrannosaurids. So, how do we classify a Tyrannosaurid? Well, to classify a T-Rex, or a T-Rex, a Tyrannosaurid, it's all in the skull. Uh, the skull is the most important part of a Tyrannosaurid. It's also, the hip bone is also extremely important, because the uh, ischium, which is the bone that points, uh, oh, sorry, the pubis, which is the bone that points backwards in the hip bone, is only present in Tyrannosaurids as a group. All the other theropod dinosaurs have very thin, uh, forward-facing uh, pubic bones and in Tyrannosaurus or Tyrannosaurids for some reason the pubic bone is looks a bit like a uh, a, a pendulum it, it's really strange shape it's like a bell uh, also the skull for Tyrannosaurids uh, is extremely famous you can look at a Tyrannosaurid skull and instantly recognize it uh, particularly if it's a T-Rex skull but the problem arises when you get animals like T-Rex and uh, Tarbosaurus so Tarbosaurus uh, was found in Mongolia uh, by a Russian paleontological expedition in the, I want to say the 80s, I can't remember. Um, it was probably earlier than that. But basically, Tarbosaurus batar, which is the scientific name, was found and they thought it was a Tyrannosaurus because it looks exactly like a T-Rex. Well, not exactly, but it's very, very similar to Tyrannosaurus. It's the closest non-American relative to Tyrannosaurus you can get. It's so, so strange just how similar they are. They're the exact same size, they're the exact same height, they have the exact same build, um, but the only really big difference is in the skull. Now, the skull of Tarbosaurus is much, much, much thinner than, uh, than a Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, there's been a lot of theories about why this is the case or, or if uh, it's just convergent evolution that they look so similar. In my opinion, I think it is convergent evolution. I think that the Tyrannosaurus crossed over to North America millions and millions of years before Tarbosaurus even evolved. So. In my opinion, I think it's just a really, a really uh, precise case of convergent evolution when it comes to Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex. So the average size of a Tyrannosaurus rex would probably be about 39 feet, but the maximum size, we've put estimates from uh, what we call holotype specimens. Now, holotype specimens are when we only get one small fragment of bone, and we have to indicate, based on other skeletons of the same species and genre, what that animal would look like and what the size would be. So we found... Uh, claws of Tyrannosaurus that are bigger than that of Sue. And uh, Sue is a specimen that's the largest non-holotype specimen ever discovered. She is currently in a museum in Illinois, I believe, in the United States. Um, 
oh, Chicago Film Museum, sorry. She's in the Chicago Film Museum in the United States, and she's huge. She's, I think, 42 feet long, or 40 feet long, I can't remember. Um, but if you've ever seen her, there's images of her on Google, if you just search them up. She's um, been compared with, you know, humans and everything, and she's just enormous. She's tremendously huge. Uh, Sue is a really interesting specimen because her skull was actually destroyed during the fossilization process, or not destroyed, but it was flattened at the uh, at the nasal section. So they had to completely reconstruct her skull from uh, what they'd found and the remains of her skull that was still uh, present in the uh, the limestone that she was found in, or uh, I think it was limestone or sandstone or something. Now going back to Tarbosaurus, um, we think that Tarbosaurus. Or when I say we, I mean the paleontological community. We believe that Tarbosaurus is uh, the most powerful or the largest carnivorous theropod that ever lived in uh, Asia, uh, at least Eastern Asia at that point in time, uh, the Mesozoic era. So. Why we believe this is because the Tyrannosaurids are famous for being big, powerful, and, and basically just monstrous creatures. They're designed for taking down massive prey. Um, if you compared a Tyrannosaurus to a real-life animal, it would probably end up being a, um, a tiger compared with the prey animals of that tiger's area. So Tarbosaurus would be a Bengal tiger, and Tyrannosaurus would be a I don't know, Sumatran tiger or uh, some other tiger, Siberian tiger. So, I'm going to completely change subject now about the Tyrannosaurids. I'm going to list off um, two Tyrannosaurids that I think a lot of people, including many paleontologists, still think are very interchangeable species. I'm talking about Albertosaurus sarcophagus and Gargosaurus. Gargosaurus. Gorgosaurus. Uh, Gargosaurus. That should be a dinosaur. That sounds awesome. No, Gorgosaurus. Uh, I forgot the species name of Gorgosaurus. I do believe that Gorgosaurus is... Uh, Oh, what is anyway, you understand what I'm trying to say. Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus. What are the differences between the two of these animals? So Albertosaurus uh, is famous for having these really pointy brow. Uh, they're not really crests. They're more of just bone jutting out of the, the brow uh, over the uh, orbital fossa section of the eye socket. So Gorgosaurus has these as well, but as does Displetosaurus. And the three animals are usually very interchangeable between the paleontological community. A lot of paleontologists think that... Uh, Displetosaurus is just a larger Gorgosaurus, or the Gorgosaurus is just Albertosaurus, or a different species of Albertosaurus. Um, I personally think that there are enough differences between uh, all three of the species, especially Displetosaurus, because it's a really different animal to the others, to classify them as a different species. Um, Displetosaurus is a really massive animal. It's huge. It's big. It's broad. It's powerful. It's much more similar to T-Rex than Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus are, uh, respectively. Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus are... As you can probably guess, Albertosaurines or Albertosaurids, um, they are part of the group that Alluramus is in, which is a smaller, slimmer Tyrannosaurid uh, subgroup. So they're designed for pack hunting and, and, and really active hunting and predation on smaller prey. Not, not, when I say smaller prey, I don't mean you know tiny animals. I just mean smaller prey and fleet-footed prey than what Tyrannosaurus, Displetosaurus, and Trabosaurus might have hunted. Um, Tyrannosaurus is so far the largest, or at least the heaviest, Tyrannosaurid that we've ever discovered. I mean, Tarbosaurus is the same length as Tyrannosaurus, but it's not quite as big. It doesn't have the same mass. We believe T-Rex weigh between 6 and 9 tons, which is insane. That's really, really heavy. Um, and it was about the height of a two-story building, so it was about 18 feet tall uh, at its probably maximum height. Although, to be honest, I think at maximum... If you really stretched its gene pool to the limits, it would probably get to about 20 feet tall, which is just crazy. So when T-Rex was discovered, I just want to go over really quickly what uh, T-Rex actually means. Tyrannosaurus rex means tyrant lizard king, which is probably the most uh, appropriate name you could give this animal because it's just, it truly was a tyrant king. It, it was the dominant predator of its area and it was the dominant predator of all dinosaurs in my opinion i think it was the most powerful kind of theropod that ever walked the earth it had a bite force of about 6500 kilograms which is uh, the most powerful bite force any land animal has ever possessed uh, and that's enough to basically crack any bone open immediately that's just it'll be like popping a balloon that's that's pretty much the best uh example i can give in that in that uh condition so, if a Tyrannosaurus bit down on a human skull, it would be 
it would just be destroyed. It would be pulverized. It would be dust. The T-Rex, its head is so much bigger than a human's. You'd actually have to position the skull of a human like on the teeth of the T-Rex just to get it to actually bite it because the head's so big that it would just roll around inside the skull. Um, so Tyrannosaurids evolved from... Um, they, they actually have really... They evolved from the coelurosaurs, the firstly. Uh, but... They, their ancestors go way back to about the mid-Jurassic period, where we think Guanlong... Guanlong, as far as we know, is the earliest uh, currently discovered sp uh, uh, Tyrannosaurid. Or Tyrannosaurid... Part <laughs> member of the Tyrannosauroidea. It's a really weird word. Tyrannosauroidea. Uh, Tyrannosauroidea is different to Tyrannosaurid and Tyrannosauridae and Tyrannosaurine. I don't even know if that's a, a professional term, Tyrannosaurine. But in layman's terms, Tyrannosauroidea is basically just a big covering of anything even closely related to Tyrannosaurus. It covers the, you know, Guanlong, and it covers... I actually think it might cover some Coelurosaurus, I'm not really sure. Um, I believe Bistahivasaurus is a Tyrannosaurid, isn't it? I've completely... I'm going to pull up a chart, actually. I've got a book here of Tyrannosaurus. I'm going to open that up. Uh, okay. Nope. This book, by the way, is called The Tyrannosaur Chronicles. It's the biology of the tyrant dinosaurs by David Hone, and I strongly recommend that you get this book. It is probably the best dinosaur book I've ever owned. It is insane. It teaches you everything about the Tyrannosaurid dinosaurs and the prey that they hunted and the ecosystems they lived in. Um, it's really, really useful. Okay, so the phylogeny of the Tyrannosaurs, which is basically just the massive uh, family tree in, in a more professional sense, starts off as the Tyrannosauroidea. Now, as I said before, Tyrannosauroidea covers every single animal classified or even closely related to a Tyrannosaurid. So, very early on, we get the Proceratosauridae. So, if you've ever heard of Proceratosaurus, it was named that because when they discovered it, it had the three horns on its head. They thought it was a relative or an ancestor to Ceratosaurus during the Jurassic period. But uh, very, very recently, actually, we discovered that the Proceratosauridae, which includes Coleskis and Stokesosaurus, were actually uh, members of the Tyrannosauroidea, but they're very, very distant members, I will add. They're not related to the rest of the Tyrannosaurids, they just sort of split off, they diverged from the group very, very long ago. That includes Guanlong, Proceratosaurus, and uh, Sinotyrannus, and I think Durotyrant. I cannot remember if Durotyrant is a Proceratosaurid. I'm going to have to check that up later. So, the rest of the uh, Tyrannosauridae, Includes Dilong, Eutyrannus, uh, Eotyrannus. Uh, I'm trying to think of the more um, unknown ones because, you know, I've obviously talked about Tarbosaurus and T Rex and Gorgosaurus and Dyslidosaurus, but I'm trying to really think about uh, the others. I think Raptorex, Dryptosaurus. Apalachiosaurus is a really commonly debated one for some reason. A lot of people don't think that Apalachiosaurus is a Tyrannosaurid. I don't understand why you would even think that. I mean, if it, you're talking about Guanlong, I'd understand it because Guanlong is such a different animal when you look at it compared to a T-Rex or a Tyrannosaurus, but Apalachiosaurus is like, almost, it looks really, really similar to Albertosaurus and Electrosaurus, so I'm not really sure why people would think that Apalachiosaurus is not a Tyrannosaurid. Now, there's a really interesting one called Xian Guanlong. Now, Xian Guanlong, as you can imagine, is a Southeast Asian Tyrannosaurid, um, and it lived in an area that was probably very swampy and marshy, which is why I find it really interesting. I'm, I'm really fascinated in the colors of, of Tyrannosaurids and dinosaurs in general. I've always thought that if we can determine what the animal's ecosystem looked like, then we can pretty much determine what colors it had, because predators will always be camouflaged with their surroundings. That's just, it's the it's just how it works. You know, you look at lions and they've got that really tan or really light brown coloring that's to blend in with the tall grasses that they hunt in when they hunt the, uh, the zebras and the buffalo and the water and the wildebeest. And tigers have those stripes on them to blend in with the forest floor and um, the thin trees that they hunt in. So, in my opinion, animals like Xian Guanlong would be really dark browns with maybe some spots or um, a dark greens or, or lime greens or some sort of, you know, really dark marshy sort of color. Uh, animals like Tyrannosaurus, which probably lived in redwoods in those sorts of areas, um, probably were really light brown. Um, and I've just thought of something else, actually, that I wanted to talk about, which is probably the most heated debate about Tyrannosaurids in uh, recent times. Feathers. Did T-Rex have feathers? In my opinion, it absolutely did. I'm going to explain why right now. 
I've already made a video about this, but uh, I didn't really back it up with much evidence, and I'm going to talk about that. So, if you take an animal, um, uh, okay, so Tyrannosaurus had relatives and ancestors back in um, hundreds of millions of years, oh, not hundreds of millions of years, but millions of years before it existed that had feathers all over them. Now, in my opinion, you cannot regress a trait completely. There will always be some uh, remains of that trait passed on to your ancestors. For example, I've got blue eyes, right? Um, now, blue eyes is a recessive gene in, in the gene pool um, because it's a mutated gene. So if I had children and one child had blue eyes, the other ones would have brown eyes or whatever the other uh, parent has, that gene is going to get passed on even if it is a recessive gene. So feathers could be a recessive gene in the Tyrannosaurus, but it's still going to get passed on down to, uh, even if they're just carriers of the gene, they will still be carrying that gene and they're... Uh, offspring could have the gene. Now, obviously, feathers in Tyrannosaurus is not a recessive gene. It's a dominant gene, which means that you have like a 90% chance of getting those feathers if you are a Tyrannosaurid and you have uh, offspring. So I am 100% certain that Tyrannosaurus had feathers in it to some degree. Yes, we found scale impressions, but they were very, very, very small. They're minuscule scale impressions on the uh, left side of the leg, of the upper leg, and I think some on the tail. Um, now, these scale impressions, to me, uh, show that the scales were really soft and smooth. They're not that big reptilian Godzilla-like scales that everyone thinks the T-Rex had. Um, it, think of more the skin on your elbows and the skin on your knees, that sort of slightly rougher but still sort of soft, bumpy, rigid skin. That's probably what T-Rex had. It's very similar to that. Um, uh, if you look at modern birds, they're completely covered in feathers. And, I, and I'm, t I'm not talking about Tyrannosaurids anymore. I'm more diverging into dinosaurs now. A, a, a misconception that a lot of people think is that the uh, dinosaurs are extinct. They're not extinct. They're living, they're flourishing, actually, right now. They're doing exceptionally well. Uh, dinosaurs are, uh, birds are dinosaurs. So we, we've got, we split them into two different groups, so that, not to confuse them. Um, a bird is just as much a dinosaur as a T-Rex is. And a lot of people in the general public seem to really uh, struggle to grasp that concept. So when you take a bird, if you took a modern bird like a cassowary or an emu or an ostrich, that's what we call a non-avian bird, a non-avian dinosaur, sorry. And the classic dinosaurs, you know, big T-Rex and, and, and Sinonychosaurus and, and uh, even Apatosaurus, they're what we call a, a non-avian dinosaurs. Sorry, so I think I called the birds... Uh, non-avian, the birds are avian, okay? So even if it can't fly, like an ostrich or a penguin, they're still avian dinosaurs because they're, they're part of the bird group. They're part of the group uh, classified as birds. Prehistoric birds, um, like Ichthyonis, they're still uh, avian dinosaurs. So as until you get back to about the stage of Archaeopteryx, anything after Archaeopteryx in the evolutionary line is generally considered a avian dinosaur. Anything before that is a non-avian dinosaur. That's what we can classify them generally as um, on, on the evolutionary tier list. So I've been talking for almost 20 minutes and I sort of want to start wrapping it up as this little podcast goes to shit. But um, I just want to talk about some more misconceptions. Um, a lot of people seem to think that all prehistoric creatures are dinosaurs. That is one of the most incorrect things you can possibly say. I've had someone... I have a smile on skull on display in my office. And I've had someone come in and look at it and say, oh, that's a dinosaur skull. Like, what dinosaur is that? And I just look at them like they're a complete idiot because I, I just cannot comprehend how you can look at a smile on and call it a dinosaur. It's seriously, I do not understand it. So uh, dinosaurs by classification are uh, lizard-hipped and bird-hipped. So ornithians, ornithians, and uh, saurischians. So, so saur, by the bay, by the way, by the bay, should be a song. By the way, saurician or um, saurus as a word means lizard, which is why a dinosaur means terrible lizard. That's what the word means. Dino means terrible in, in Greek or Latin, I can't remember. And saurus means uh, lizard. So I hate the word dinosaur. I personally despise it because it's, in my opinion, one of the worst definitions science has ever produced for an animal or an animal group. That would be like calling humans uh, venators, which just means hunters because we pretty much kill everything. So 
dinosaurs weren't terrible. They were amazing and beautiful and graceful animals. And they weren't lizards, which is another misconception. People seem to think that lizards descended from dinosaurs. They didn't. Uh, neither did crocodiles. Crocodiles and dinosaurs actually share a very... Uh, uh, they share the same common ancestor as the archosaurs, but the crocodiles, or the at the time, the phytosaurs, split off from the archosaurs and evolved into the crocodiles uh, just before the Mesozoic era, or during the Mesozoic era, and then evolved down to what we have today in the saltwater crocodiles and Nile crocodiles and alligators and all the uh, different crocodilians. So dinosaurs as a group sort of evolved uh, out of the archosaurs, and they didn't really change much. The first early dinosaurs were, they were theropods. And the theropod dinosaurs uh, were the first dinosaurs to evolve. They, you know, you, you've got, uh, uh, I think, I don't know what the f general consensus is as the first dinosaur. The problem with this is we can never tell what the first of any animal group is because evolution doesn't just work like that. You don't just take an animal and evolve it into something and then it's instantly that other animal and looks completely different. It takes millions and millions of years. Humans have been evolving very slowly um, over the last 200,000 years. You might notice that uh, we've lost a lot of hair in our bodies. We've got all these different eye colors. We've got, um, uh, we're actually losing our pinky toes and a lot of our other smaller toes. And the reason for that is because we just don't need them anymore. Uh, our ancestors needed them to climb and grab things and, and you know use things with their feet. But we don't use our feet for that. We just use them for walking. As a species, we're getting taller. We're getting smarter. It might not seem like it, but we are, trust me. <laughs> and um, our eyes are actually getting bigger. I don't know if anyone's noticed that, but human eyes are generally getting larger. And that's all just for reproductive purposes. I don't really understand why, but it is. <sighs> that's been 22 minutes and 25 seconds of me talking. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now. I think that I've talked enough. My throat hurts. I don't, I've probably voice cracked a couple of times doing this. Uh I hope this was entertaining. I just sort of went on a rant about random things. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you all... Oh, listening, sorry. <laughs> and I will see you all next time. Cheers.